A. Smith, Council Chambers, City Hall. We are going to go ahead and start with um, our first discussion item, actually. So, number one, school response, police officer John Stern. I told him to be here oh. at 5, because I thought it would be a little later. So oh. I'm gonna okay. Five. Scratch that. Just so he gets done. Yeah, if he has another <laughs> okay. thing he has to do. So, I guess when he comes in, we'll <laughs> finish whatever we're doing and yeah, okay. move yeah, along. <laughs> okay, so we have the regular proposed agenda. We have mayor's awards. Um, couple proclamations. Do you want to go back to them? Okay. Just, Just kidding. Back to discussion <laughs> item number one. <laughs> yes. Awesome. I figured you got, if you got somewhere else to go, you might as well. Good afternoon. Um, I'm John Stern. I'm with the Burlington Police Department. Uh, I'm currently assigned as the school resource officer at the high school. Uh, I've been in that capacity for the past two years, and prior to that, I was the middle school resource officer for two years. Uh, it's my understanding you guys want to kind of hear what we're doing to protect our students. Um, well, prior to all, or prior to each start of the school year, uh, the staff is trained and the ALICE procedures. And what ALICE stands for is alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. Uh, this, consists, this training consists of a review of the uh, ALICE protocols and then several practice scenarios involving uh, locking down, barricading, evacuating, and countering the attacker. Um, after each scenario is done, we do a debrief with the, with the uh, staff. Um, we do a crisis plan, and it's reviewed annually and then updated also. And basically what this crisis plan covers is everything from an active shooter to um, a medical emergency. Um, and what we've done is uh, each staff member, we've put a flip chart together for them that has all of this information in there that they can keep in their, uh, their rooms next to their uh, rosters. Uh, in case of an emergency, they can go right to that flip chart and this go down point to point to point to point as to what they need to do. Um, we review the building security annually. Um, the object obviously is to harden the target. Uh, and it, one of the things that we did here in the last uh, school year is we updated the camera systems. We got three new servers for the camera systems and it's improved the, uh, the uh, camera quality, picture quality immensely. Um, we talked about the emergency procedures guide. Um, they're also given placards for each room. Um, they're encouraged again to keep this stuff in an area so in case something was to happen, it's, it's right there for them. Um, we encourage the staff and supply them with uh, safety buckets. Basically, it's a five-gallon bucket that uh, has um, some toiletry items, some uh, first aid items, uh, water, um, snacks, in case they had to be locked in there for an extended period of time. Uh, during the school year, uh, schools are always in a status of what's called soft lockdown. And basically what that means is that all the exterior doors and windows are secured. Uh, all the interior classroom doors are locked. Uh, this is a great starting point for them. It's a good place to start. Um, if a guest comes in, they are directed to the office where they are identified. Uh, they have to sign in and then they're also given a visitor's pass. Um, we've inst or we've uh, initiated uh, the incident command structure at Burlington High School. We have a dedicated spot as our incident command in the high school. Um, one thing that I always and, and the staff always encourages is, is to the students, if they see something, say something. Um, as a district, uh, each school tries to do um, lockdown drills. Um, ideally, I would love to see a lockdown drill every quarter. Um, 
most generally it's between one and four lockdowns uh, during a school year that we do. Um, since the students uh, brought this to our attention and had some concerns, I've met with several of the students and talked to them about their concerns. Um, we've reviewed uh, the procedures that we have in place. Um, Mr. Kane, the principal at the high school, wanted me to uh, come up with some training videos. Um, I was able to ascertain a couple training videos uh, showing middle schools and high schools going into lockdown using the ALICE procedures. Um, those have been uh, sent out to uh, all the students to watch at their leisure. Um, and again, we've uh, continued to discuss how to better harden our target. So we're always looking to improve things. And I believe that's the best way to do things. Questions? Um, I guess maybe for me, I, I just curious to know what some of the students' concerns were. Um, you, can... you know, some of their concerns were that we don't do enough training. Okay. Um, you know, and anytime we can do more training, I'm all for that. You know, that, that's going to make us that much better. Mm -hmm. um, I often talk about. Um, you know, if an incident happens, you're going to fall back on your gross motor skills. You know, those finite skills, it, I, I've often compared it to like shooting a basketball, shooting a three throw. All right, the first time that you went and shot a three throw, pretty sure you did. First 10, you probably didn't make it. I can't make 10 now, so it's no big deal. But you practice it. You shoot 10, 15, 20, 30 a day, and by the end of the month, you're hitting seven or eight out of 10. You're falling back on those gross motor skills that, that you're going to ingrain in you. That's what I like to do with the training. I like to go over these things so that they will fall back on, we need to barricade, we need to prepare ourselves, we need to do this, this, and this. Is, is Alice a national program that we subscribe to, or is it something, just an outline that's kind of uh, been drawn up and tried and proven, and, and we just have adopted it? Um, Alice was created uh, by a uh, teacher and I believe a, an officer down in Texas, if I remember correctly. It's a national program. Um, they provide training to officers, school administrators, staff members. Um, I'm an instructor in that. I've been to, through that training. We then come back and teach our local uh, schools, businesses, etc. The, the concepts that, that we uh, that we have. Okay, and and you mentioned the hardening of a target, and, and I think one of the reasons you, you may be here tonight is because uh, the question was posed to me through an email from my concerns is and um, of do we have anything in place, and, and I did not respond to that. I know that we've probably got SOPs or, or standard operating procedures in place that maybe you don't want to discuss, which is perfectly fine, just because of the fact that we don't want to put that out there for everybody. But the biggest concern was making sure that we had taken the steps ahead of time to make sure that in the event something were to happen like an active school shooter that we're prepared um, and that we've discussed this and thought about it beforehand um, then you know having a, an event like that take place and then not having anything prepared for it. Sure um, yes we prepare regularly for this um, um, even after we do a drill whether it be a fire drill, a tornado drill, um, a, a, a lockdown drill we do a debrief and we see if we need to make any changes, modifications, do we need to correct something. Um, like I said, every year we go over this plan and make adjustments, uh, whether it be um, adjusting different staff members to different responsibilities, uh, all the way up to, um, like I said, this year I was able to uh, um, get a, the new servers for the cameras to help us with our, with our hardening of our target. Yeah. Any other questions? Does that kind of answer? I mean, is that what you guys were looking for? I, I, mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I think, like I said, we just wanted to make sure, or, or the community just wants to make sure that those things have already been thought about, discussed, and planned for in the event that something like that were to happen. So I think sure. you've shown that tonight. Outstanding. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so going back. <laughs> Um, we have mayor's awards and then a couple proclamations. Um, 
Tenure Award and Citizens Academy graduation. Uh, let's see. Number six is a public hearing, consideration of sale of a portion of North 7th Street right-of-way located west of the property, property locally known as 625 Valley Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Uh, the property at 625 Valley, I think, recently went up for auction. During that process, uh, they found that what appears to be a portion of the building still remain in city right away. Uh, looking through our files, it was vacated in, in I believe, 1957. Uh, went through the city council and was vacated. There's no record that it was actually transferred at that time. Uh, generally, whenever we vacate right away now, we have a sale as part of that ordinance, but there was no record at that time that it had ever been sold. So uh, they've requested to uh, purchase that portion of right away uh, that was vacated uh, over 60, 70 years ago. So um, this is just uh, selling that portion of right away uh, to the property adjacent to them. Uh, did have uh, interest from the property to the west about possibly vacating the remaining portion of right away. There is a sewer that runs down um, this half of the right of way, uh, so we'd not be vacating any more of that. We want to retain that for that sewer. So, uh, selling approximately 40 feet of right of way and retaining uh, the other half of the right of way for that sewer. Um, uh, but uh, RR Development Inc. Uh, did put in a, a bid to uh, purchase this property. Okay. Any questions? None on that. All right. The next is. Um, Consideration of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of South 14th Street right of way located adjacent to the property at 1408 Harrison Avenue. Um, this property, uh, the portions of property to the north of this were vacated and sold a couple years ago. Um, this went through that process at that time. It was recommended to vacate the entire portion. Uh, and sell it, but the property of 1408, I think, was under contract sale at the time, and the uh, owner, property owner, not the contract purchaser, did not have interest at that time. I think the contract has been fulfilled, and the owner now desires to purchase that portion of right away. Um, uh, so this would be vacating and uh, selling uh, that portion right away just to the west of this. This is a unusual area where the uh, somewhat alley and the street were in the same right away. Um, had a lot of discussion at the time, but uh, the properties, the four properties to the north, as you can see, have already uh, acquired and uh, combined their lots with that right away. Uh, so this did run all the way north over that portion. Um, so this is the final lot that would uh, kind of complete that. Uh, there is an easement that is maintained over that for utilities and access. Uh, the property owners all know that. So. Um, uh, again, this is just uh, kind of completing that process that was started a couple years ago um, by uh, vacating and then selling that portion right away to that neighbor. Right, very good. Any questions? None. Nope. All right. Next, we have a resolution approving bond purchase agreement for general obligation corporate purpose bonds, series 2018A. <laughs> okay, since she's not going to talk, uh, we, this is, uh, we've gone through several steps for authorizing the going out for the issuance of bonds, gone through the rating process so that we can do it. The projects that are being funded with this are um, repairs to Central, Aven Central Street Bridge, Central Avenue Bridge, um, Mount Pleasant Street uh, Bridge, um, that's the larger one. The Central Avenue is 350000 uh, 4.35 for Mount Pleasant Street, um, about 1.9 million for a flood wall, uh, and uh, 1.55 for, I think that's about it for principal on um, general street projects. Um, it's, uh, we do a resurfacing, that's our hot mix HMA project, the 1.4 million, and then general uh, miscellaneous in the 150,000 range. Um, total is total bonded amount, uh, included inclusive of costs for bond issuance, is anticipated in 8,350,000 range. The 
resolution you have here is for not to exceed eight million five hundred thousand, which is what we went out and advertised for. Um, and uh, I don't know, does Travis here next week? That's something I haven't even talked with him about. But we're looking at a sale for this next week and see where our numbers come in, and hopefully they're fairly close to um, what he what our preliminary numbers were. That I mean, the interest rate changes that have occurred have been in line with what was anticipated as we went through the budget process. Okay. Any questions right now? I, I don't have any. Okay. No. All right. Uh, next, we have a resolution approving the final plat of Beam subdivision. This is a one lot subdivision. Um, this is in the two mile area of Des Moines County, uh, just directly across from city right away on Mill or city property or city corporate limits off Mill Dam Road. Uh, subdividing off one lot from a larger lot. Uh, I think it's zoned commercial. They're looking to uh, develop a commercial property in this location. Um, Ariel shows a little bit more where it's at. Um, uh, down past uh, Case, uh, coming up Mill Dam Road with the golf course to the east. Uh, Des Moines uh, County Highway 99 and Tamer Road there are, are there to the east and the golf course to the west. Uh, but just subdividing this lot off of this larger uh, tract here. Um, again, any property within the two mile growth area of the city uh, requires subdivision review and approval by the city as well as the county. What's going in there? Um, he's talked about a shooting range at that location. I'm assuming it's an indoor shooting range. Yeah, correct. Okay. Any other questions? Have we touched base with the uh, do we even have the authority to uh, discuss this with the residents that's right next to that? I mean, last time I checked, shooting ranges are probably pretty loud. Um, they, the Beams family owns the property to the north and south of this, okay. so the only ones affected yeah, would okay. be the, the golf course and the large area there. Uh, but any the construction portion of it is controlled by the county uh, land use administrator. All, the only authority we have is subdivision. There's the review. Okay. Yep. All right, sounds good. Next, we have resolution approving the final plat of RBI Limited Subdivision. I don't know. Same thing here. This, again, is in the two-mile area, splitting off one lot um, from a larger area. Um, this is north off of uh, Tamer Road. Um, one lot, approximately two acres in size. Um, just on the back side of the levee there. Um, Splitting off the portion in yellow and retaining the remaining portion with the uh, lot there. Again, a one lot subdivision uh, within our two mile review area. Uh, they do have a access easement at this kind of juncture there for the property to the north and then to allow property to the south. Okay. Any questions? All right, next we have a resolution amending the storm water utility system fees pursuant to chapter 100.02 of the Burlington City Code. Okay, the next four resolutions kind of all go together. These are the fees that we approved when we approved the budget, the amounts that we have have budgeted for. So the first one is the storm water and it had an, in a 3% increase on the fees compared to last year. The next, if you have any questions about any of them, just let me know. Um, the next one is the sewer user fees. Um, that, too, everything was um, increased by 3%. These will all be given to the waterworks, and then they will get them effective July 1st of 2018 for, for those bills. Solid waste fees, that resolution is increasing the monthly fee to $14.25 from $14, which we talked about during the budget, too. And then the last one is the septic hauler user fees too. Um, all of them have been increased by 3%. So, And these are the fees that are reflective of the sewer separation order, right? <coughs> yes. Okay. Uh, we did uh, annual 9% rate increases for quite some time. Uh, last one of those was 2012, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. And since then we've been been a 3% a annual rate increases. DNR has been willing to work with us 
at that kind of maintaining a three level. percent annually. Okay. Although where that goes as we present a facility plan remains to be seen uh, with the work, the scale of work that is involved in that, and uh, how long that would extend the project life cycle if if we were to try to do that with three percent rate increases. Any other questions? No? Okay. So that puts us down into the proposed consent agenda. Uh, first one is resolution amending swimming lesson fees for Dankwart Park Pool. Uh, the city approved an agreement uh, for operation of the pool uh, with the dome, and as uh, once that's constructed and as part of that, uh, for operation of swimming lessons uh, under that same agreement. Uh, the agreement states that uh, fees for swimming lessons shall be reasonable, reasonably comparable to other local lesson fees and shall be approved by the uh, city council. Um, so the swimming lessons uh, moving forward would be operated um, by a, a separate agreement. Um, they're proposing uh, three separate uh, fee structures, uh, $38 for group lessons, which includes eight, um, 40-minute lessons uh, up to a 12 to 1 student to instructor ratio, $60 for semi-private lessons, includes four 30-minute lessons with a, a typical 3 to 1 student to instructor ratio and 115 for advanced group lessons. That includes eight 45-minute lessons uh, with a typical 6 to 1 student to instructor ratio uh, with an early bird discount on the um, group or private lessons there uh, through April 30th. Um, again, these were proposed by the, the group operating this, uh, the pool. Um, they are here if you have any questions or comments on it, too. Any questions or? No. No? Okay. Looks good. I got nothing. <laughs> uh, the next we have um, a resolution. We have some set date for public hearings, uh, April 16th. We have consideration of plans and specifications for the 2018 Seal Coat Street Program. Uh, consideration of plans and specifications for the 2018 HMA Overlay Project. Consideration of an application for a housing sustainability grant from the Iowa Economic Development Authority Community Development Block Grant Program. Consideration of an ordinance amending Chapter 163 Environmental Nuisances of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Burlington, Iowa. And consideration of an ordinance repealing Chapter 100 Stormwater Utility and replacing with a new Chapter 100 Stormwater Utility. Could I interject on this yes. part? Mm -hmm. um, even though we have three different, we already had the three resolutions, uh, storm stormwater utility fees, sewer fees, and then uh, septic. septic hauler yeah. fees that are all, that all go into our sewer account. Um, those are all with the, I mean, the overall goal of doing the 3% annual increases. Um, and that the one specifically towards the stormwater fees is increasing as of July 1. This ordinance below that we're mm -hmm. setting a public hearing on is for implement if we can get it done for him and, and it goes goes through the process is for implementation for July 1 as well um, it would replace the section um, we need to at least have uh, specifically the we for from a timing perspective for waterworks to be able to get their billings done mm -hmm. on the the residential side the residential rates are going to be the base residential rates are going to be staying the same under both the current system and what we're looking to transition to um, we need to have authorization for them to be sending bills out based off of our current ordinance structure and the rates that are based off of it. At the same time, we're going to be coming through the process over the course of the next few meetings uh, after a presentation tonight as a basis of that, talking about uh, re completely changing how we do our stormwater fees. Um, at the same time, the base rate's going to be the same amount for residential. We're going to change the structure primarily on the, the commercial, break that up into what I would say would be more categories instead of the three basic categories that are listed in here for square footage. Um, and it will change how we allocate the funds when they come in. Uh, instead, 
after that process, instead of having the two sets of funds, the sewer and the stormwater all coming into one pot, we're going to we're going to need to go into a system where we're breaking those up into two separate funds and that really treating that as a separate fund. Uh, there's a lot there. They all interplay, but they do relate well with each other. The rates that we're going in place give us a basis to move forward under our existing set. The resolution does, uh, but we'll do an ordinance that will replace it. Overall, well, you'll get to go into the, the structure here as we get into the work session later to talk about what the changes are going to be from the one to the other. But just want you to know that we are doing stuff that based Mm -hmm. They're contradictory, but we have to go through with where we're at currently and then what we're transitioning to. Okay. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Um, now we're on to our discussion items. I guess we will start with the police annual report. Thank you, sir. Last one. Yeah. Thank you. You have some extra copies for. Yeah. The copies okay. Of that. Oh, you want me to leave one behind? No, I can. I can get them to Kathy. Yeah, that works. I just okay. wanted to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> No. Ready? Well, good evening. I'm going to present you with the Burlington Police Department 2017 annual report. So I want to start off by, we actually try to put quite a bit of time into our cover page and the photos that are on that cover page because they're really significant as to what we accomplished in 2017. And the top photo is Daniel Ramiro. He's a probationary officer with the Burlington Police Department. As you know, we have spent a lot of time and dedicated a lot of time to recruiting minorities to the department. We feel like this was a, another major accomplishment for us. I mean, until age of 13, he lived in the Philippines, came over to America, spent time with his family in California, went back and forth a few times, but ultimately settled in Peoria where he went on to Macomb to get a four-year degree in law enforcement. And he's just a spectacular individual. He's doing great. He's still in the field training program, but he's probably within three or four weeks to at least getting out on solo patrol on his own. So that's just something we're really proud of. And Daniel's a great guy. The second photo is a reserve officer. That's reserve officer Jeff Good. And he participates every year with us at our Shop of the Cop event. So that's what he's doing, shopping there a little bit. And then the bottom picture of the two majors in the organization with a young child that wants to grow up to be a police officer, and that was at our Safe Trick or Treat night at the auditorium. So that's just a little bit of a what kind of effort goes in, I guess, just to cover. It's, it's more than just a cover to us. So major accomplishments. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the facility. We're not in the facility yet, but all the design and all the effort and all the work that has gone into the facility, we're getting awful close. We're still looking at that mid-May so we can get down there and, and get in the building. I think that first, second week of June, you'll see that there's actually some operations that have been transferred in that building and will be up and running. So that's something else we're really proud of. We've been working hard on our critical incident team. As you know, we talk and talk and talk about mental illness in our communities and the the stress that's putting on public resources and especially the police department. Well, how do we deal with that and how do we make a difference? So about a year, actually two years ago, and we really hit it hard last year, was training officers in how to deal with mental illness. Yeah, we get four hours of required training a year. That's, that doesn't even start to scratch the surface. So what we're trying to do is get to the point where they're now where we have trained the trainers. Guys that are good enough at this now that can start training other officers what they know, and it's, it's starting to work. As a matter of fact, we're starting to have some real success. These officers are willing to come out to scenes where it's over the head, if you will, for lack of a better word, of the officers that's on the scene. We're getting to the point where we're trying to get a portal system opened up to where we can have, a, let's say, FaceTime, if you will, or Skype, or whatever technology, so we could actually talk to a licensed psychiatrist, psychologist, that we could start to communicate and intervene while we're on the scene. I mean, and that, that's going to be hugely helpful. 
And with, with this, we're working with the BHAT team at the hospital to make sure we have a place to go. I mean, it's always difficult to have a place. Where can we even get somebody evaluated? Because there's times that they're full, they're busy. And so this whole program is a, a collaborative effort that has seven, I think seven, multiple counties involved to, to make a difference. And they're, they're starting partnerships, like I said, with the jails, with the hospitals, with law enforcement. So collectively, we can maybe start to make a difference in this. Because it's a difficult situation for us to deal with as a, let's say, call for service. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 4th of July celebration, that really turned out to be a huge success. I mean, we thought it would have an impact on the neighborhood, but when it was all said and done, and even yet to, today I had comments on the importance of that and kind of the, the good feeling it brought to the neighborhood with police, fire, all the emergency services up there, public officials such as yourselves that were up there, and people felt safe. They felt like they could come out for a day and enjoy the day. So that was a big success, and I would expect that to continue. Uh, we did get the dispatch center relocated at the hospital. It's out there now. It's up and running. There's, for the most part, it was, a, it was a fairly seamless move from the perspective of the user. Now, I think they have gone through a lot trying to make it work, and kudos <laughs> to them. I think there's still things that they're working on, but really for the user, for us on the other end, it went, it went, it went fairly well. Uh, the K-9 unit, talk about that a little bit. It's, it's been just a huge success for us, and we continue just to improve on that program. Like I told you before, we kind of, we made an adjustment with that. Instead of having it in the POP unit, we put it back on patrol where to actually spend more time with more patrol officers to get more use out of the dog, and that seems to really be working. It's been a highly successful program, thanks to the community, $70,000 worth, thank you. Uh, it's been a, if not necessarily a, a written goal, it's been a, a clear, it's been clear to us at the police department we need to work on nuisances, abandoned vehicles, so we strive to do this, and the, of those 472 abandoned vehicles, we're talking about one part-time employee. That primarily, you know, works on parking downtown. We all know her, Vicki, great lady. But when she's not down there working, she's out working on these abandoned vehicles. Not to say officers don't work some, they do, but for the very most part, Vicki's helping us with this. So we're diligently trying to clean that up. And, and you'll see a little bit further here in the annual report, but we have definitely seen a decrease in shots fired calls and a, an increase in gun seizures which that, that was, it's still an ongoing goal of ours, gun violence in the community. There's no question that's still going to be one of our top priorities. But as we go through this, I think I can confidently say we're making some progress. In the reserve unit, what can you say? 789 hours, almost 780 hours they dedicated to the department and the community. I mean, that's, that's impressive. So thanks to all the gals and guys involved in that unit. It's much appreciated. And we kind of have gone through this with you before, so I won't take a lot of time with this, but this just really does kind of lay out how the department is organized. If you're not familiar, and I know I'm confident that you guys and gals are all, all familiar with this. Uh, the only thing I'd point out is we talked about that. We had a resignation, and that would be Officer Prickett that was under Squad D with Sergeant Zahn. So that has created an opening in the organization. So it's, it's just an ongoing challenge all the time to keep, keep the place up to staff, if you will. Any questions about that chart? I went through it kind of fast, but I, we've just gone through it before. So, so years of service and, and how many, that, that's important for a department to keep track of. And you'll note there's 11 officers with three years or less experience. So it seems like we're kind of stacked up on the the young side of things, and then we're going to have quite a few officers that have over 23, 21 years of experience, actually. So it's a little bit better balanced than it was when we started talking about this four or five years ago. We saw a pretty good gap in the middle, and that can be kind of concerning as you try to promote people and you move forward in the organization and your succession planning. But it seems like we're kind of getting a little bit better balance there now. I mean, you got quite a few officers from that. 11 years through 27 years, which is, which is kind of nice to see. Any questions about that? And this is something else that we track is our post-secondary years of education. 
And for the longest time, we the best we could get was to 50% two year versus four year. So now we're really starting to see that that's we're starting to make a difference there and talking to people and the importance of education. And it seems like every year we end up with about 25 to 30 applications. Now those are the people that have passed everything, filled out an application, and we can at least start looking at them. I'm going to say that number in today's world is 60% four year plus degrees. So. I mean, in law enforcement today, it's changed drastically than what it was even a mere 10 years ago. There's just a lot of people that are seeking out a four-year degree in, in our field. So that's, that's a good thing. It's a good sign. Talk about calls for service. These aren't necessarily responses. That'll be on the next slide. But these are calls for service that come into the dispatch center that have to be dealt with. And some of them, as you'll read on there, some of them may be a background check or a driver's license check. But for the most part, these are calls for service that the Burlington Police Department handled, that the Sheriff's Office, and that West, or West Burlington. And, and we put that in there just for a comparison. I mean, I know we're the big brother, and I know we have more officers, but I think the Sheriff's Office is around 20 sworn. And so we're just a little over double of that, if you will. And so when it comes from calls for service, I mean, that's a lot of calls for service. 36,000 calls in a year is a lot of calls for service. And so we just like to point that out that it gets pretty busy down there. But this is a little, I don't want to say a better rep representation, but what this is is actual calls that required a police response, that we actually responded to with these calls. And you'll see that, that they're trending up, and I'll show you here in the other slides why that's happening which in this case is a positive thing. And, and a lot of this will center around, we had more officers in 17 than we've had in a long time. And so when you have more officers, you're gonna have a lot more self-initiated activities and directed activities that we've been able to do. And I'll kind of show you. So as I look through them and really trying to drill down the numbers, that's where the calls are coming from. Things that, that we're initiating, that we're having a chance to do a little bit more proactive things than we've ever been able to in the past. And that just comes with the pop unit and the opportunity to start doing some things that we haven't had the chance to. So that's a good thing. That call, those, those calls for service coming up is a really good thing. And this is a breakdown of all those calls for service. I'm just going to kind of flip through these. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But that's, that's just what that is. It's just simply a, a breakdown of, of all those calls. So here's our top 10 calls for service. And I specifically want to talk about the suspicious person activity. That's something we've worked really, really hard on as a department. I know you heard Officer Stern <coughs> kind of touch on that, say something, or see something, say something. Well, we've really tried to put that out. And if you look, this is only a two-year comparison, but if we went back three, four, five years, always before our animal calls were our highest call for service. And we're now the last three years for sure, the suspicious person call is the highest. And that, and that should be. I think if we're getting our message out there and we're doing, excuse me, doing what we're supposed to do, then those calls should be coming in. And so we encourage that. If you see something that you're not comfortable with, call us. And it doesn't matter. If it's not a violation, we'll figure that out when we get there. But if, if you're uncomfortable, there's a reason. There's something telling you that something isn't right, and I'd like somebody to look at that. So... So people in the community are responding, and that's great. That's what we want. So that is just something I wanted to point out. Our property accidents are down as well. And I, and I got another slide that, that kind of talks about that, so we're proud of that too. And domestic violence is down. So this is going to talk a little bit about citations, traffic citations. In... And as the chief of police, and you're going to have a new chief, and this might change, but as the chief of police, I, for the last five and a half years, have really tried to drill home causation. I mean, I don't, let's not be out there writing tickets to be writing tickets. I mean, anybody can sit on Kern Street. It's a 25-mile-an-hour zone on the overpass. And that, to me, is not policing. That's not policing. What policing is is, okay, we're having accidents at this intersection. People are running this stop sign or they're speeding through this area and they shouldn't be. Let's work on that. Let's get in our school zones. Let's protect our kids. 
And if, if there's a reason or there's cause, let's do that. Let's write a ticket. And I'm good with that. That's, that's what we're there for. And so it's having an effect because our fatalities are pretty much non-existent. Our property damage accidents are going down and our personal injury accidents are going down. So to me, that's really what traffic enforcement is all about. Now, I might be in the minority as that, to say that. I think there's other law enforcement chiefs, administrators, that they, they like to see those numbers up. Well, I don't look at it from a numbers. I look at it from strictly causation. If we have a problem, let's do something about it. Let's keep our people safe. That's what it's for. So of those citations, this just gives you a breakdown of the most frequent citations. And kind of the, to me, our highest numbers here are, are kind of a little bit disturbing. I mean, we look at proof of insurance, look at license suspended or revoked, and non-registered vehicles. I mean, and most of those go hand in hand, because a lot of people that are suspended can't register their vehicle and they can't get insurance. So just to point out to the community, this is a problem, and I think as, as we live in a community and we talk about bridges out of poverty and people that are in situations that struggle to make their rent, they struggle to put food on the table, and then we compound all these other problems in there, it's just something to think about. I think it's a reflection of maybe the status of, of some people in the community that have difficulties getting by every day. You know, and, and as a police department, you sure try to recognize that. As a community, we should try to recognize that and be mindful of that. So just kind of as you continue your careers with the council, you know, I'd ask you kind of keep track of that. I mean, there's a reason for that. Those are major league fines, and they all kind of, like I said, they, they join back together. I can't afford insurance, and I'm suspended, so I can't register my car, but I have to try to get to work. And, and you see this whole thing, this, you know, and I wish I had an answer for that. I mean, the bottom line, you get in an accident, you cause a problem, you don't have insurance. I mean, you're going to get a ticket, you know, but I don't know. Is that really how we solve this problem? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I think it's, in, it's important that as a community we're well aware of this. Yeah. Is that something that we can adjust from a policy standpoint? I mean, at the end of the day, and I, and I bring up a scenario where there was a local um, officer that worked for uh, Fishing Game, uh, and he basically said that if you were to catch somebody fishing without a fishing license, it, the goal wasn't to ticket them for fishing without a fishing license. The goal was for them to go get a license so that they're actively and legally participating in something that he thinks he'd like to see more actively or more people participate in. So is there a policy or something that could be adopted or looked at where if somebody gets pulled over either for lack of insurance or lack of vehicle registration, I understand the suspended part is probably something that leads from uh, a previous charge, um, but is there something in place where if we were to issue a citation, the citation could be removed if those requirements are met within a specific amount of time? Uh, no. I mean, okay. those kind of things can't be done by policy. Okay. That'd have to be something that was agreed upon with the court. And, you know, whether the judge felt like doing that or working with the defendant, whatever the case may be. And like I said, a lot of these situations happen where we have victims that have a valid license mm -hmm. and they have insurance and now we're involved in this motor vehicle accident and somebody doesn't have neither in it. And there needs to, that needs dealt with too. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that is kind of a, a difficult situation. I just feel like it's important we know the kind of the status of why things are the way they are. Accidents would have to be excluded from that scenario. Sure, sure. The incident, but. Yeah, and again, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I know that's not something we could change with policy. Okay. I mean, but. It's a good question. It's, it, that, that would sure spur a topic of discussion. Okay. So here's a separate slide for motor vehicle accidents, and this will clearly demonstrate what I was talking about. So the property damage accidents are on a nice downward trend. The, the personal injury accidents are down, and, and it's, it's really obviously unfortunate we had a fatality in 2016. God bless that family. But from 2010 to 2017, that's, that's the one fatality we had in the community, and that's, uh, those are pretty positive numbers from, a, from an accident standpoint. Like I said, we, the one fatality is a, a 
really, really bad deal for everybody involved. And we hate that. So this will kind of look at our incidents. And as our calls for service go up and our self-initiated activities go up, your incidents are going to go right up with them. So again, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, I look at incidents. We're doing our job. I mean, the more CFSs we have, we for, for sure should be having more incidents. Those percentages should probably stay pretty much the same. And I think from a UCR standpoint or how we're compared to other communities standpoint, a lot of places report incidences different than we do. But to me, UCR is very clear on their guidelines on how incidents are to be reported. And I think you're going to see some changes in this. I actually think the federal government is trying to combine what's called IBR, which is incident-based reporting, and UCR, which is unified crime. I, they're trying to combine those two so we can get more of a streamlined, what I want to say, everybody on the same page reporting. And like they said, the government said, and they're going to be right, if they go to that system, you're going to see that Crime in general, as it's reported, is going to seem like an increase because there's going to be, I don't want to say agencies forced, but there's going to be a different way reporting is done. As an example, technically, if you had 10 car burglaries in one block and they all happened last night, by UCR standards, you could report that as one burglary because it happened basically at the same time, same location, same type of crime. But here's the problem with that. Now you've got all these 10 people lumped into one case when really, to me, they're clearly 10 separate cases. You're a victim, you're a victim, and you're a victim. And you maybe lost something far more important than you lost. So as an agency, we need to separate those cases and work those cases. So it might be the same suspect inevitably, but that's okay. You're still treated with a lot of respect and, and you're truly a victim of that crime. So you can kind of see where now all of a sudden Burlington shows 10 burglaries, and another comparable city might show one. Hmm. And they're technically not in violation of the UCR rules by doing that. But I do think if they combine these and this, this keeps moving forward, I think you'll see a more standardized way of reporting. So, and, and there's a lot of cities report just like we do. I don't want to make it sound like we're the only one, because that's not true at all. A lot of them report every incident as we do. But just so you know, there's other places that don't. Hmm. So this again is a breakdown of, of those incidents. And if you have any question about any one of those, feel free to ask me. But there's just way too many of them to stand here and try to go through those. I, I do, Chief. It, it yeah. looks like there's a pretty huge jump in the uh, drug narcotic violations. Oh yeah, yes there was. And as a matter of fact, I can explain that. And again, this is reporting. And the way it was always reported before, is those are strictly our cases. We get a lot of help from, let's say, even out-of-state task forces, state agencies, federal agencies. And I made it a point last year and told the task force, if you're helping, if you're assisting on a case and we're using manpower to do that, we need to be tracking that. And so I said, I want a CFS or an incident on every case you're involved in, whether we initiated the case or whether we didn't. So that's a great question, and as this point forward, it's kind of like our shots fired call when I went back and said, I want evidence. I want to know for sure that there were shots fired. I want casings, I want a bullet, I want multiple witnesses. We, we need to know that that happened, that it wasn't a car backfiring, a transformer, a firework. And so this is very similar to that. Okay. And, and I think in the future you'll see in 1819, it'll be a lot more balanced. That's why it looks so far out of whack. Okay is just is a reporting thing. But just above that, the weapon law violation, and you'll kind of see that later on, as, as we've had a, as we try to pinpoint gun violence, I mean, we've made, like I said, targeted projects to try to get as, as many guns off the street as we can. So the next slide will be arrests, and these are criminal arrests. And again, you'll see that number coming up, but if you look at those charts, they're all kind of about the same. When you look at CFSs, 
incidents, and then arrests. And, and they should. I mean, the more incidents we have, we should have more arrests if we're doing our job. So percentage-wise, those are just kind of coming up together. And, and again, that's proactive patrols that have had time to be assigned to certain areas in an effort to reduce crime. So we're proud of that number. We think that you give us the resources. You, you gave us some people to try to deal with the problem, and we're dealing with it. So we're really proud of that. And I've only tracked this for two years, 16 and 17, because I think it's important that the community understands and that really everybody understands that, that repeat offenders are a problem. I mean, it's not only a problem for law enforcement, it's a problem for the community, it's a problem for the court system. And do I have the answers to change that? No, but I think it's important when you look through here that you had five people there were 24 people that had five or more arrests. You had 78 people that with three or more, and 262 with two or more. So, I mean, it's, we, we have repeat offenders. And I don't think we're distinctly different than anybody else with that, but I thought it was something that we needed as a department to track. I'm not misreading this. Somebody was arrested 14 times. Where are you at? Which line are you at? All the way at the bottom. All the way at the bottom. In 2016. Yeah, in 16, one individual was arrested 14 times. That's correct. No, you're not misreading it. Well, it kind of goes back to your suspended license, though, too. It does. Because, you know, constantly see the same names in the paper. It right? does. And in this case, the 14, you're talking about homelessness. Okay. Hmm. And, and problems associated with homelessness. Absolutely. You're not being arrested for being homeless, but when you're homeless, it just brings on a lot of other problems sure. that we're all aware of. And it's really unfortunate sometimes that, that those things get placed on the backs of law enforcement mm -hmm. because we have to do something. Especially when you have a community that has resources available to help with those types of things, which yeah. we do. So. Yeah. But with that, you got to keep in mind alcohol addiction and mm -hmm. drug addiction and those things, too. Yep. So this is something that we track probably every agency in the country. should, If they don't, they should track this. So in 2017, our use of force was, we had 16 uses of force. And what that is is if we have to manage somebody, it's simply more than just a, a verbal confrontation. I mean, if it comes to the point that we actually have to put our hands on you and you're resistive to that and we have to handcuff you or if we have to use a form of force, whether that's hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, OC, taser, ASP, whatever the case may be, that's documented on a subject management report and we track those reports. And so ideally we would never use force, but that is, it just doesn't work out that way. But if you look at 13 through 17, percentage-wise, we use less than half of 1%. And if you look at that 1.4%, that says police contacts. That doesn't say anything about being arrested. And our contacts are in the tens of thousands. If that starts to give you any relation about how good of a job these patrolmen are at verbally de-escalating these situations. I mean, you're talking about 2,392 physical arrests, and of those 16 times we had to use force other than verbal de-escalation. good. So we did, we've already kind of talked about this briefly, but this chart is a, is a real good indicator that you can see that our carrying weapons charges are up and our shots fired calls are down. So again, that's, that's headed in the right direction. There's been an extremely amount of, of hours and effort put towards this problem. I mean, any shot fired call is one too many, don't get me wrong. But we're well aware of the problem. It's a goal of ours and we're working really hard at it. So the, the pretty much a 100% increase in, in um, carrying weapons yeah charges yeah is that is that just because of the active measures taken as a result of more officers or no doubt about it okay proactive patrols for sure no question about it vehicle stops 
in guns. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'll, towards the end, on my very next slide, you'll see how many guns the department seized. And keep in mind, these are unlawful, unlawful guns. Do you, do you have a number for the number of stops that we did this year versus last year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would have been back in, I don't, it might be an incidence here. Let me go back. It's either an incidence or the calls for service chart. Let me run back to that calls for service. I don't know if I'll be able to read it. Yeah, it's under, weapon, under law. Traffic stuff? Yeah, weapon law violation 41. What, yeah, I'm looking for it. I think he was asking. No, I just wanted stuff. to see the correlation between traffic stops and. Oh, traffic. Yeah, that's what. Traffic, okay, so traffic yeah, from stops. five last year was five thousand two hundred twenty six, and this so, year was seven thousand five hundred ninety. Yeah, it's almost two over two thousand more yeah. traffic stops. Yep, and again, that's why calls for service. The minute you stop a car, that's a CFS, and then if anything happens during that stop, it becomes an incident. Right. And like I said, that's why you saw those charts just trending together. Yep. Okay. So that brings us to this slide, the, the POP unit and what they've accomplished this year. And you can kind of read down through there for yourselves the numbers, but I'm telling you, that's, that's a lot of arrests. I mean, that's, that's two people that are really dedicated to their job and working really hard. I mean, just that two-man unit alone sees 23 pistols, four shotguns, three rifles, five knives. I mean, they felony warrant arrests, 37, misdemeanor arrests, 106. I mean. It's, it's unbelievable what they've done. And then the very last is department-wide gun seizures. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous amount of, of guns that have come off the streets. And not all those are from traffic stops. Some of those are from search warrants as well, whether it's a, it's a felon in possession of firearms. Could be a search warrant where narcotics were involved, the combination of the narcotics and firearms. So community involvement and community engagement, I mean, that, that's a real goal of the organization as well, too, and we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to engage the community and in keeping them informed of what we do and trying to build a rapport with them. And, and again, you can kind of see the pictures and, and read that for yourself. But as you're going through that, most generally, not all the time, but I'd say most generally, those activities officers come in on their own time on their day off to participate in those activities we just put it out there we just ask them they're not required to they're not paid overtime to do it and they come in and do it so I mean there's a lot there's a lot to be said for that not all of those activities but a tremendous amount of them so it brings us to our goals for 2017, both of the majors put these goals together. I mean, they're obviously going to be extremely active in, in the police department. That should have been goals for 2018. A little bit of a typo there. We'll forgive you that one. Yeah, all right. Thank all right. you. They're all printed up anyway. <laughs> uh, but, but our number one goal, it goes without saying, I mean, reducing gun violence is the top priority. And we, we are. We're utilizing every resource we can get our hands on. I mean, we use the ATF, the federal, the state, local. I mean, every, every avenue we have, it's, it's our top priority in the organization. And you can read down through, through the rest, rest of those. The only other one I'd point out that got approved in the budget that's extremely important is Lexapol. And getting all of our policies updated, but just as importantly as the training that they provide with every one of those policies. With this program, we can actually train every day at our briefing sessions on one policy or another. It's a web-based program. They can look it up at home if they want. It, it'll be a, a major accomplishment for the organization. 
And I thank the council and Mr. Furneaux for approving uh, the money to accomplish that task. Questions? I know that was quite a bit. I don't have any questions. Just thank you for this and thank everyone else too that's been doing such a great job. I will. Thank you. We're going to miss your support. leadership, Chief. Yeah. Just, you know, we keep saying it, but I mean it. So thank you. Thank you. There's thank a lot of experience much. walking out the door, so it's going to hurt. But um, the, the only question I have, Chief, is personnel wise. <clears throat> Do you feel like an increase in personnel would? you'd see a sharp increase in these numbers or do you feel like it'd start to level off and, and and basically i mean i'm assuming you'll answer that based off of the environment out there on the street which i nor anybody else up here has the ability to experience so what do you think of you know i think it would level off i do but you can see you can clearly see what two people can do just two people with the ability that they're not running calls I mean, you saw 33,000 calls, and think in terms of, hmm. for the most part, 30 people. 30 people run those 30,000 calls. That's the patrol division. And granted, they get a ton of help from all these other places, but those calls for service that go out, they come into that patrol division and they run those calls. So each of them are responsible for over 1,000 calls a year. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot. It doesn't leave any time to do these other things. So with your help and the help of a federal grant we had two people that don't have to answer those calls but we ask them to do certain things every day here's where we want you here's who we want you working on here's what we want you doing and i mean they they're doing it they produce and then yeah and the numbers speak for themselves so to answer your question yeah i think at some point that that no question is going to taper off but what could two more do Thanks. Yep, thank you. All right. Next we have our stormwater utility fee feasibility study. Good evening, I'm Leo Foley, Veenstra and Kim. Uh, stormwater utility, um, as Jim pointed out, you're very well aware that you, you have a utility, a lot of people in the state do. Uh, stormwater regulations are getting more complicated. The state and federal are putting more complications and more costs onto you all the time. Also, there's much higher, um, uh, people are much more interested in water quality and that again has an increasing cost typically communities pay for that out of either a sanitary or streets budget uh, even with like you you have a utility but you, you mingle the monies together so now a lot of cities are really looking at separating so that they have a stormwater utility separate and it basically pays for itself and the intent is to make it equitable and that means that it's a fair way of doing it. Currently, a lot of communities do it. They, they, they assign a dollar value. And what happens is the residential ends up paying a higher proportion of the cost for, for what, what they're getting. So that's what we were, we were tasked to do, is look into this. So there's your, your uh, ordinance, Chapter 100. Uh, the charges and fees are adopted every year through a resolution or almost every year and the next slide shows you right now you're currently for an unmetered residential it's two dollars and fifty cents and then you can see in red how much it has increased since 2014 generally a stepping thing this is very very common this is how you you, you metered residential unmetered multifamily commercial industrial is all based on square footage and this is how you've been doing it so this shows how many dollars that you actually have been collecting for stormwater. So last year, you collected a little over $565,000 for stormwater. Okay, so back to V&K was, was hired to investigate 
alternatives to implementation of a stormwater utility fee. Measure the impervious areas of all the metered properties. So, so not only, not, not the single family, but all of the metered properties to remeasure them with GIS. Review types of improvements that could be funded using the stormwater utility. How will the utility operate? And then present the results and help you with implementation. So the next one tells you the property information we got from the Des Moines County GIS site. Um, it has parcel IDs, property classifications, and boundaries. And we use that. We brought it into our system. The quality of the aerial photography is very good. A lot of your properties were measured years ago when they first came in for permits, and the quality wasn't very good. So part of that was, was doing that. Obvious areas included roofs, driveways, sidewalks, that type of thing. Gravel surfaces were assumed to be impervious. Pretty much everybody handles it that way. This is just a map. I'm just going to buzz through this a little bit. This is showing all the areas that we ended up measuring in red. That all the areas that had different types of measurement. The next one is a little more clear, and it shows your commercial properties in blue. And then the yellow part is the impervious area of all your commercial properties. Next slide shows your industrial properties, the ones that are already, um, already regulated as industrial, and the same thing. We did an impervious thing. It tells you in the left-hand corner how many properties you had. Multifamily was the last slide in that area, and it shows you had 163 properties. Average impervious area is 12,230 feet squared. The next slide is the, the different types of methods that are commonly used. The per parcel fee, so you basically just have a fee per parcel. The next one's an impervious area. You kind of use a, a combination of those two, is your current, your current utility. It uses a little bit of a combination of those two. Equivalent residential unit. What that one means is you basically look into it, you find out what an equivalent residence has for impervious, and you use that as a single unit. And that's one that's very common in the state of Iowa. Intensity of development means that you look at the areas, and certain areas that are very intensely developed get a higher number, areas that are more rural get a lower number, and you do it that way. And then a final way that people do is called the equivalent hydraulic area, and that's kind of a combination of not only the impervious area you have, but it all, I mean, I'm sorry, not only the pervious area, impervious area, it adds the pervious area, so it kind of adds the two together. VNK looked at them all, and basically for the city of Burlington, we think the ERU method, the equivalent residential unit, is probably the smartest method to go through, and that's the one we did most of our homework on. Seem to be common. It's very, very common in the state of Iowa. When we showed the different methods to the staff, they seem to, to favor that one also. So we measured the impervious areas of a representative sample. So how do you, how do you figure out what one equivalent residential unit is equal to? Because that's really the, the biggest factor that you need to do. US EPA has a manual on how to do it, very high statistical analysis, and that's what we use. That means it's defendable. Somebody comes in and wants to challenge it, you have a very good defense of here's how it's done. And that's how we figured out that. Um, all the non-single family units were measured. And the number of, so, so if you had if you, have a, if you have a ERU that's equal to so much, let's just say it's an easy number, maybe it's one square foot. If you had a commercial house that had a commercial place that had two square feet, that's two ERUs. So it's an easy calculation. So we, using the, uh, the EPA method, we had to measure 150 residential properties, and we selected them at a, ran, at a random generation. And we looked at what was that impervious area. It turns out to be 3,360 square feet. Therefore, one ERU is equal to 3,360 feet squared. ERUs in the state of Iowa range anywhere from 2,200 square feet to 4,000, um, just depending on what the community is made up of. Seemed to be, to me, 
more of the newer communities seem to have a higher one, and the low and the communities that are older seem to push to the middle or, or lower. Um, what we did just for just for calculation purposes, we said now if we're going to do this new method, let's take a look at what the current rate is for a, uh, for a residential. So the current rate is two dollars and fifty cents. So we said let's just estimate two dollars and fifty cents per equivalent residential union, unit. Fees in the state of Iowa range from a dollar to about six dollars. So what we did here, this slide didn't quite show up as good as I wanted, but it shows that if you use that two dollars and fifty cents, and you can see down at the very bottom, bottom on residential, so there's approximately 9,831 9, 8, 9, residential properties, you're charging two dollars and fifty cents, you're getting $294,930 for that. And we did it for all the properties, all the different types of properties. Comes up to a sum somewhere if you, about $700,000 if you did it that way. Currently, you're getting $565,000. So it's considered a more fair and a more equitable way of doing it because that one ERU tells you that's how much impervious thing. Uh, especially for small commercial, it's, it's fair and more equitable, where typically small commercial and single family pay a higher proportion. So what it does is it, 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 it makes it a better, better representation. All commercial, industrial, and multifamily properties have had impervious areas measured. So that means there's, there's really not a lot of argument because they can't it's going to be on a measured thing where they can see it on a GIS. Part this is what, just showing what some, oh, go ahead. So if you were to use our existing rate structure uh, and you would put in just the better measurements that you did with GIS, what would the revenues be? Yeah, it would have been, it, it would have been much closer. Probably, I don't have that number right off the top of my head. But where we said it was 700 versus 565, I want to think maybe 100,000 of that, or 75 to 100,000, is just due to better measurements. So, in primarily what we've found with the measurements with our, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but the, a lot of the commercial industrial uh, were being billed based off of uh, building permit mm -hmm. data, which was more just the building facility itself and not the parking lots even though our ordinance is structured that they should have been or they added parking or, lots or something yeah. somehow they added even gravel sometimes so our existing charge system should have been charging them for them um, right. just it hadn't been caught this is something where a, a big chunk of the change in the Correct. revenues that are being talked about has to do with just getting good measurements on the impervious surface and billing appropriately and this presentation, too, by the way, has uh, Nick has gotten to do with the chamber at one of their morning board meetings, so that they can be forewarned. The business community can have an idea of what's what's being talked about. Now, that doesn't hit everybody within the, invest, the commercial and industrial sector, but it's at least part of that outreach that's been tried to get done to let folks know that there is a change that's coming up. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Center, but oh, that's fine. Then. The next slide here shows a comparison. And what it's really showing is what is the current, if you had so much impervious area, under your current resolution, under the proposed ERU unit, how much would you be paying? So it's kind of interesting to look at. Under, if you had a small area, 2,000 square feet, under your current resolution, you'd be paying $12.50. Under the proposed ERE, ERU, you'd be paying $2.50. But as you get to the bigger areas, go to the last one, if you had 400,000 feet squared, then you would have been paying $200. Now you'll be paying $365. So that's what we talk about, moving the money to make it fair and equitable. That's what I think, I think Jim's getting at, is that we did need to make sure that everybody knows this kind of thing's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what percentage of the properties that you guys surveyed were under the 10,000 square foot? Any idea? I do not know that right off, right off, right off my hand. I'd ha I can get back to you on that. 
So I, I think a lot, but I don't know. Okay. Okay, uses of increased fees. What can be done with the money that, that, that you get? And I think you've, you're already doing this. Stormwater sewer improvements, elimination of cross connections. We understand that's, that's big. Stormwater detention, green infrastructure. That can all be used uh, for my also. Uh, managing a stormwater utility can be used with the, with the monies. Stormwater utility fee reduction application. This is one that a lot of communities go into, not all, but a lot do. They offer opportunities for landowners to reduce but not eliminate. Uh, Nick, for instance, grabbed one that's a really good one in the state of Iowa. Marion has one that has this. Bettendorf, Iowa, where I live, has one where you can you can apply to get a reduction um, uh, in your stormwater fee, basically by doing a number of things that we'll go over. Trouble with that one is it, it reduces revenues, of course, but it also it, it creates paperwork. Somebody has to manage that mm -hmm. program and be able to make those decisions. These are the practices. Um, these are, the, these are the practices that people usually use um, for consideration in the residential area. For instance, a rain barrel. But it's not a simple rain barrel a lot of times. That barrel has to be certain size. It has to be hooked up so it doesn't just overflow. And there's a lot of, a lot of things that go to there. You can't reduce, for most cities, you can't reduce your fee any more than, say, 50%. And, and with one of these type of things. So that's things we're still working on. The next one shows practices that are available for, for commercial, industrial, and multifamily. The one, a detention pond, retention type pond. Those are very, very common. And a lot of the industrial and, and the larger commercial will do that type of thing. So that's something we have to consider. Okay. And this one just, just is showing some examples of the percent credit that could be given. And this is the area we've, we've, we've thrown this out. We haven't looked at it for you in a lot of, um, uh, we haven't tried to tie it to revenue yet. But that's something we're working on right now. Again, this just shows quantification of how you would do certain things, flood control, retention ponds, how you would have to do it. None of it's as simple as you would think. A lot of people think they can just dig a hole and call it good, and that's usually not going to work. So what are our next steps? Recommended by the next step is to adopt the new stormwater utility based on the equivalent re residential unit. And if that method's uh, adopted, then we have other things to do. As I said, VNK's report recommends that. Your staff recommends it. And truly, the, the Iowa Association of Municipal Governments pretty much is, I don't want to say they're, they're pushing people to it, but they're certainly making it very easy for everybody to go to this kind of thing. I don't know of very, I know of very few communities not, not going this direction. Next step, existing ordinance, chapter 100. It needs to be repealed and replaced with the new ordinance. The new ordinance must fully describe the new utility purpose, objective, and the implementation clauses. The Iowa State has a nice model that's more or less fill in the blank, and then you tailor it to fit the city of Burlington. Um, Nick and I have already taken a good look at that. I think it would fit very well for what you, want, you will want. So that's the next thing we need to start looking at. We'd have to, you could put the rate structure in that. Most people take the rate structure and do it as a resolution, kind of like what you've been doing in the past. It also covers very well dispute resolution, the rights of homeowners or, or any owners to appeal how the adjustments and how the credits would be. So this is stuff that along with all the definitions, because in this stormwater utility, what is a resident? What is impervious? These are all important subjects that the state's really already defined for us in this agreement. 
What's the schedule? In, it, initiate the implementation of the revised stormwater utility by July 1st, 2018, assuming we can get into the meetings we need to so that we can work with the water board. The initial ERU will be equal to the 33,660 square feet, and that's the, uh, the impervious area for an average single family home in Burlington. The initial ERU charge would be $2.58, which you've gone through, I guess, the first reading tonight. Resolution. First resolution. The resolution. The resolution. Okay. The current cost we, we talked about was $2.50. The initial estimate for fiscal year 18 revenue would be about $724,000 without adjustments. So if, if, if we decide to entertain ideas like rain barrels or detention ponds and you're going to give a redu reduction, then that number is going to go down. From what I've been hearing from other cities, it doesn't go down as much as anybody would think. So that's something I've, I'd like to put a hard number of what I think in this town it would go down to. <clears throat> I think Bettendorf told me $5,000. Hmm. So that's not a big dollar value for compared to that. So again, and I've, I've done some, 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 a little bit of discussion with other cities, cities that have implemented this relatively recently, that have very good programs in, in Marion, Coralville, Bettendorf, they're all worth probably talking to and trying to see exactly how many people utilize based on their populations, that type of thing, and how does it impact revenues. The next thing we wanted to say is, uh, the ordinance, maybe the credit system could have other benefits. Of course, reducing runoff, that's a big benefit. Now your storm systems don't get charged with all the water. You get um, the benefits of potential grant opportunities. A lot of the things that you guys are now being very successful getting, I think maybe having a credit system might help that. Um, I'm not sure how much. It's never a one-to-one -one where you can do it, but I, I know that in grant applications, especially water quality benefits are highly looked at for future monies. But of course, everything gets down to it has to it has to fit your city and what are the impacts on the revenue? What are the costs that you coming up? I think Jim alluded to it. You have a lot of stormwater and sanitary and combination uh, costs that are coming in the future. So I think this this type of a this type of a utility will help you address some of that in the future, and it kind of sets you up. With that, are there any questions? This isn't a new utility. It's just a restructuring. This is not a new utility. And it would, it would involve us eliminating a previous resolution, right? And then reenacting this new one? That our, our, it, would, go ahead. it would take the, we have an existing ordinance that, that uh, establishes our stormwater utility and gives out the definitions, this would replace it with a new one with different definitions. And it's, it's primarily moving over to that ERU unit as a basis for what we're doing, right. which is the model that, again, it's one that's used across the state, and it's not just Iowa. This is something that really has come down from a, a national level as a, what most places are doing. No, it just makes it's sense. It's not everyone. A, lo a, lot of the, a lot of the regulations that you have to that cost you money come from the US EPA and this is sponsored a lot by the US EPA a lot of the documentation comes from like how do you figure out what an ERU unit is for sure. a community is it's a standardization that's created driven. by the state it, may, it makes perfect sense uh, I mean I, I really like the idea of this I, I would say one thing that I would prefer to see go along with this is like you said the mitigation that can be done on the property or in order to hold the water I, I don't like the idea of, of creating new fee structures, and, and I, or I would prefer to see us create the new fee structures with the idea that people can also reduce that fee by taking steps necessary in order to. I mean, it helps us in a lot of levels. It helps us on the sewer separation side of things. Oh. Um, one of the things that we've been working on with the long-term stormwater planning, the technical assistance we're getting from the EPA, and then a conversation that we will have later with the DNR to try and renegotiate consent order. Some of these 
credit type activities, mm -hmm. the, the retention, the rain gardens, that type of thing will benefit us if we can show that the community is participating in that type of thing. It also will maybe have an impact on future regulations when it comes to... <laughs> And it, that's, that's, that's that chair's chair. broken. You don't want that one. Oh, <laughs> and, 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 and P uh, requirements. Um, I also have a handout uh, that the Iowa uh, Municipal Utility uh, Association put out on ERUs. It's from 2016. It's only 66, I shouldn't say it's only, 66 cities responded to this survey, and it kind of gives you a breakdown of what square footage has been, what they are charging for their ERU. Um, some of them cap certain um, categorizations and others don't. So I just wanted to hand this out to you just to kind of explain a little bit further what the ERU method is um, across the state of Iowa. Okay. Do, you guys, do you guys agree that the, it's better to have a program where people can re reduce that cost? Um, yes, I would, but I, I suppose how, how difficult or time-consuming would that be for us to get this going because I know you said that that would be something later on or that you're that, that's something we were looking. hoping by July by July of this year to have the have the program basically in place but probably by January have all of the details for what 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 could be done and mm -hmm. that way and I, what I mean by details how much time would it take to monitor mm -hmm. what kind of things like, like, for instance, a rain barrel, you could say 10%, you could say 15 you could say 50%. How much percentage? So those are the type of things that we, we want to get worked out in the next couple of months. And what I don't remember, just even looking at the Marion ordinance with theirs, uh, it has the language in there for the credit to be done, but I can't remember if it details out the specifics of the different methods or if it just gives the struct overall structure and the methods are established else or later. It, separate. It, it gives the category, but I don't think it tells you, for instance, how to do certain things. So it doesn't so give that it's, detail. It's kind of general, and I don't know if that's yeah. where you're looking with the, and I, I know that you have been working on that base ordinance to, for us to do. Does it include that in that now, or is that something that you're looking to modify the I think, ordinance I think that, after? Or? I think that's something we'd have to work on. We'd have to modify the ordinance just to get that in there. Yeah, and, and I think that we, we, we'd we like to get the base ordinance mm -hmm. in because the rate structure makes sense. I mean, July 1 is when we get it done. Mm -hmm. And um, it'd be nice to do it now rather than be in a spot to have to wait a year to modify that part. Um, but as they to work on what the different things that are workable and I think part of the concern is which of those are too time intensive just be, because they're right. so little bang for the buck and yet require a lot of work when we don't have any staff that um, if whatever we do we're going to be pulling someone away from something else to do and that's um, to go out and verify that they're, yep. what they're saying they're doing some of them doing. are more time intensive than yeah, others some, to some verify are, too some of them are pretty obvious and aren't going to require a lot of time yeah I'm just thinking like another special entity wants to put in a retention pond I mean that's a pretty quick the commercial one the commercial ones are or, usually a little easier because yeah. they already have to do a site plan right yep. and that's included and as we go more toward metered residents uh, I mean you've already got somebody going out there to get a reading so I mean it's not us so it's not us yeah oh it's a walk yeah, it's, yeah. I, th I think I think so what we're saying is you got to put the base ordinance in but we will pledge to work yep. on a, well, a, a credit this system is, this is to our benefit yeah I mean we want to that's what that. we're hearing so from a from a staff side it makes sense because we are also trying to use this leverage this into other areas yeah as well okay all right thank, thank you. you thanks Leo all right, next we have uh, the treasurer's report. Okay. So the packet was February's treasurer's report. Um, I don't think there's anything unusual going on. We still have a few accounts that are in deficits. Most of those are just timing issues, waiting on grant funds, um, bond funds. So, um, we have some projects that need to get closed out that are, you know, we're waiting on the money right now. So um, our revenues seem to be trending a little bit less than like the ideal percentage, but um, that's, you know, some of those are based on our seasonal revenues. So you're not going to see those revenues in the, in the, 
at this time of the year, so those will start trending up um, as we start opening the red plucks in the golf course. Our expenses are pretty much right on target, so do you have anything to add, Jim? Not really. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Did, um, did we get a final number on the sewer thing over by Ivy? I don't think that project's Not done, done Nick. And it's still, I don't think we have a final number. With the quantity adjustments and the change order that we had talked about previous, about set, fixing the pipe in between the two known spots, uh, and then after talking with Jesse about doing some hydro seeding because of the steepness, we'll be over two hundred thousand dollars with yeah. that emergency repair. Which is, we we knew that that change order was going to be thirty to forty thousand dollars with the extra pipe, but the the quantity adjustments really were um, we got affected trying to replace the the fill dirt that was there with clay um, to be able to hold that slope. So. Um, it's not ideal, but it's hard to quantify that. Yeah. So it, it's more of a quantity adjustment than a true change order um, with that dollar figure. But it's not ideal to see the, a project bid out the way it was to end up at that you know that magnitude. But it had to be fixed. It had to be so. fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have um, some appointments. Or one appointment, excuse me. Anybody have any issues? Nope. Okay. Thank you for their service. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, anything? No? Uh, actually, the only thing, and it's probably more of a, Linda's not here. She sent me a, a text and an email reminder. Uh, DPI is looking for uh, looking for artists for the uh, bench painting applications. So I'm sure we'll bring that up at the city city council meeting as well. Okay. No, I think I uh, my wife and I are expecting a son this weekend, so I may or may not be here Monday. Good I'll luck. Let know. Sounds good. Oh, yeah. I like a fat cigar, Matt. <laughs> I had to give those up a long time ago. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I did. <laughs> yeah, anybody? No. Okay. Anyone from the back? Nothing? Oh, okay. I hope it's good news. It's better news than I gave you last week. Okay. Um, after I sat down with Jesse, uh, you know, the Agency Street Project, they, they finished up the Jimmy John's driveway, which should open tomorrow, at which point they will close down the frontage road. Um, we talked with the contractor. We will not be shutting down West Burlington Avenue right away. Uh, they'll be able to work on the frontage road um, outside, inside, and do that quick like so they can try and work on Broadway um, because we realized shutting down both Broadway and West Burlington Avenue would be uh, no. not ideal. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Um, <laughs> So we will, we're will. we going to try and work okay. that. So hopefully they will get Broadway Great. done, and then we can start up West Burlington Avenue, uh, Start on get done with their section that Good. they're trying to do right now. Way to now. be flexible. So, Thank you. So we're trying to, try and work That's with great. that. That's so. great. And the, I, the one thing, other thing I heard is ITC, which is the power line that runs on the, set, on the north side of Agency Street, uh, will not be coming in until May to move their power lines um, on both sides of Roosevelt. So the intersection at the frontage road will be in red flash until, until that can be done. So the intersection will be probably complete at that point, but it'll still be in red flash because we can't get that other mast arm up until they move their power. Sure. So. Um, I had a question. Why, why is, um, is it Kirkwood? Red flash. Kirkwood short. Roosevelt? There's a short underneath there. They okay. have to, they're going to have to pull new wire. All right. Okay. All right. I have that's it, then this meeting's adjourned. Okay. <laughs>